Peter Bowles here, cardiologist. Now, I wanted to give you a brief update on a very common condition in the community, and that is obstructive sleep apnea. Now, more than 400 million people globally suffer this condition and have moderate to severe sleep apnea. In addition to lifestyle changes and reduction of weight, for example, the first line treatment is usually something called CPAP therapy or continuous positive airway pressure. And that involves a facial mask or nasal mask that through a machine delivers a positive pressure to keep the airway open, nose, and obviously the throat and going into the, uh, into the airways keeps that open to allow the air to be delivered down into the lungs and therefore oxygen being delivered into the lungs to then allow it to pass through the rest of the body. Now, we know that sleep apnea is a very common condition, and I know personally many patients of mine who have been diagnosed with sleep apnea are unfortunately not able to tolerate CPAP treatment. Now, that is a major challenge. CPAP is the first line treatment. However, it can be difficult. Many of my patients say they can't sleep with it. They feel claustrophobic. They feel it delivers quite a lot of high pressure. And they, after giving it a good try for a few weeks, are unable to continue it. Now, sleep apnea can have very nonspecific symptoms. Of course, your partner might say that you are snoring or stopping breathing at night and you have to be nudged to woken up to, to start breathing. But during the daytime, you might have headaches, you might feel tired, you might feel sleepy, you might want to have a nap during the course of the afternoon. And these are all the nonspecific symptoms of sleep apnea. However, sleep apnea can also increase cardiovascular risks. And in particular, we know that sleep apnea, when not treated well, can cause a high blood pressure, can also put you at risk of arrhythmias such as atrial fibrillation or AF. So it's a troublesome condition and difficult to manage. Now, in Atlanta, Georgia, there is a current meeting underway by the American College of Cardiology. And at that meeting, there's been a study presented from a group of Singaporean cardiologists and respiratory doctors who have actually assessed patients with obstructive sleep apnea and have looked at two different types of treatments. Now, they had a total of about 320 patients, and these patients all had a high risk of cardiovascular disease at high cholesterol levels, high blood pressure readings, a past history of heart disease, stroke, and then they performed sleep studies and assessed who had severe sleep apnea from this group. Out of the 320 odd patients, there were 220 patients that on the sleep study had moderate to severe sleep apnea. Now they then divided these two groups into treatment with CPAP therapy or using a mandibular advancement device or a splint. Now the mandibular advancement device essentially is there to keep the airway open by putting pressure on the lower jaw and moving the tongue forward. So by doing that, it actually permits air to travel more freely through the airways into the lungs to deliver oxygen. Now, when they assessed these patients and they then performed 24-hour blood pressure monitoring six months after treatment, there was a significant improvement in blood pressure control in those patients who were randomly assigned to using the mandibular splint device versus those who were treated with CPAP therapy. Now, there are a few questions as to why this was the case when we know CPAP is the first line. And the key factor here was that in the CPAP therapy arm, there was a lower amount of patients who were actually using CPAP or compliant with CPAP therapy. And essentially, less than a quarter of the patients at six months who were prescribed CPAP therapy were actually using CPAP therapy. And that compares to just over half or 56.5% of those patients who were assigned to having the splint device who were still using the splint device at six months. So using a splint device was not inferior to the traditional CPAP therapy. And we know that there were improvements in outcomes with respect to blood pressure. Now, the study was quite small. However, it's an important study because we have many of our patients and many of our listeners of the channel who have provided feedback 
that they cannot tolerate CPAP masks. And therefore, it's important to discuss with your healthcare professional the use of these splint devices and whether they might be appropriate for you, because we know by adhering to this, you will get better outcomes longer term and of course reduce risks of cardiovascular events in the future by controlling things like blood pressure. So that was just hot off the press as they say. I wanted to bring that to you to show that these mandibular advancement devices were not inferior to CPAP therapy. If you were prescribed to use one of these devices, you were more likely to be on it after six months and blood pressure was also better when you were treated with this device than if you were on the CPAP, whereby many of the patients were not actually compliant with CPAP after six months. So an important study, more research needs to be undertaken to show whether this is translatable to a larger patient population. But again, interesting, thought-provoking. Hopefully you found that useful. Until the next video, bye for now.